and turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and we'll be looking at verses 27 to 42. 27 to 42. Uh, last week, if you were here, we looked at the first part of Jesus, the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. And now today, we'll be looking at the second part of the story, starting in verse 27 and ending in verse 42. Okay, so John chapter 4, verses 27 to 42. Now, uh, before we read the passage, let me just kind of quickly give us the overall structure or the layout of the passage because that will kind of help us organize our thoughts and navigate through this message today. Okay, so what we have going on in this text, it's pretty much a story within a story. Okay, uh, so there are actually two stories going on here that are basically sandwiched together. Okay, so if you think about a sandwich, how many of you like sandwiches? Yeah, me too. Okay, everybody knows what a sandwich is. You have the breads, okay? So kind of at the beginning and at the end, you have this, the bread section, which represents one story. And then in the middle, you have the meat, right, or all the ingredients. And that really represents another story that's kind of sandwiched in there. And so that's kind of the structure of this passage. Our passage begins and really ends the bread section with this, this continuation of the story from last week, which was, again, the Samaritan woman at the well. That, that story kind of continues. And then the scene kind of shifts, and then you've got this middle story, the meat section, which is actually the focus today of Jesus' interaction with his disciples. Okay, And these stories are kind of connected, they are related, and they are sandwiched together really to emphasize a point. Okay, And that point we will highlight at the end of the message, okay? So you're going to have to wait till the end to figure out what the point is. All right, so that, that's the layout sort of of this passage. And with that, uh, we're going to read not the whole thing all at once, but because we have a sandwich of these two stories, we're going to kind of break up the readings according to each story, okay? Everybody got that? Okay, if you didn't, that's okay. All right, you'll figure it out as we go. All right, let me pray for us, and then we'll dive in to the passage. Father, we thank you that where your people are gathered, you are here with us. We thank you. This is such a holy moment that sometimes we just forget that the almighty God is here, desiring to speak to us through his word, through these words on the screen or on the pages right now. These are your holy words, and we want to treat them that way. We want to revere your words. We want to submit ourselves and listen to your words. So give us the ears to hear today. Give us the, the right, pure, and soft hearts, moldable hearts before you, trusting that your word is best, what you say is best. Your words are eternal life. Help us to trust you, listen to you, and submit before you today that we might experience life. Because we know as we sing so often, as we say so often, there is no life apart from you. So we come today asking for living water. Quench our souls today. Give us life. We ask it by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, John chapter 4, and let's begin with verses 27 to 30. And just to remind you, uh, the context the context is that Jesus has been speaking with the Samaritan woman at the well, and he has just revealed to her that he is able to give her living, eternal water which will quench her thirsty and desperate soul forever because he is the Messiah. Okay? He's just revealed that. That's what just has, hap has just happened. And all of this, this entire conversation has happened while Jesus' disciples have been sent away to go and get food. Okay, I don't know if you remember that, but they were sent away to go buy food in the town. Okay, so that is the context. And then now we have verse 27. The story continues, all right? This is God's word, verse 27. Just then, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? Now, let's stop right there for a second. Really quickly, the reason that the disciples are shocked that Jesus is talking at length, okay, this is a lengthy conversation. If you were here last week, you know, the lengthy conversation with a woman, the reason his disciples are shocked is because in that day, rabbis simply didn't do that. They did not do that. 
According to one commentator, okay, it was thought that for a rabbi to talk much with a woman, and get this, even his own wife, to talk much with even his own wife, it was a waste of time. <laughs> I know. And at worst, okay, at worst, it was a distraction from the most important thing that they should be doing, which is study the Torah. Distracting. Stop talking to me. I need to study the Torah, okay? And therefore, because it was distraction from doing what God had told them to do or what was very important, it was a potentially great evil to talk to a woman. Now, I know it's very offensive for many Ladies, it's Mother's Day, and we're talking about this, right? I know a lot of you are offended, could be offended by this, and I can't believe you're saying this. Don't shoot the messenger, okay? I'm just telling you how it was back then. Thank God we are li not living back then, right? That's how it was. Rabbis simply didn't engage with conversations in conversations with women. It didn't happen. But not so for Jesus. Here is Jesus doing just that. And not to mention, to add to the fact that he's talking to a woman, this is a Samaritan woman, right? She is someone that every single Jew would have had tremendous, tremendous disdain for. Okay, and if you're not sure why, I would recommend you to go watch uh, last week's sermon. Pastor Joe did a great job explaining the history of these two cultures, okay, why that was. Okay, go back and listen to that. Okay, but the disciples, they are shocked that Jesus is speaking with a woman. Now, why exactly they are silent and uh, they don't ask any questions? Right? I don't know, okay? I have no idea. But whatever the case, the point is that they are shocked and literally we could say speechless to find Jesus, their rabbi, okay? That's who they considered him to be, a rabbi speaking with this woman, Okay? So that's sort of just to, to wrap your minds around why the disciples marveled at this. It didn't happen. It's not normal. It's controversial. Okay? Now let's continue the story, and let's see what the Samaritan woman does next. Verse 28, and we'll go to verse 30. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and we're coming to him. Now, just so you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of commentary on why exactly the woman left her water jar here in verse 28. Okay? A lot of commentary on that. Some people say it was because she left it because, remember, Jesus asked her for a drink. And so she was thinking, like, I'll leave this water for Jesus to drink. Others think that it points to how excited she must have been, so excited that she just in, in hurry left her water jar and ran, forgetting about that and going, I got to tell everybody about this Jesus. And still others, they think that there's a very sp a spiritual significance about this in the fact that this woman, she came to draw physical water. That's why she went to the well. But then she received something far better, didn't she? She got spiritual water. And so she left that physical water jar behind because she don't need that anymore. She's been quenched. Okay? So, so there's a lot of interpretations, and you could think um, whatever you will, okay? I, I, but I think, okay, I think that what should really be grabbing our attention here, what should really be sticking out to us and what we should be focusing on is the fact that this woman, who you, if you remember from last week, she was a social and religious outcast, right? Remember, she had five husbands. Not even four. Five husbands. And the man that she was now living with was not her husband. She's living with a man that is not her husband. She's not married to this man. She is a religious and social outcast, which, by the way, is precisely the reason why she went out to draw water at noon. Remember that? At the hottest point of the day when nobody went to draw water. She's an outcast. She's living in deep, deep shame. She doesn't want anybody to notice her. She doesn't want to run into anybody. This woman. And what is so remarkable about these verses is look at her now. Just look at her. She is freely out in public, 
in the middle of the town for all to see, not avoiding anybody anymore. And she is declaring to everybody, the entire town, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. It is remarkable. And, and not necessarily because a man told her all that she ever did. That's not what's so remarkable about this, what she's actually saying, because anybody could have told her all that she ever did, right? The entire town knew all that she ever did. But more so, what is so remarkable is that she has no more shame. Her shame is gone. The shame of all of her past mistakes, even her present mistakes, it's no more. That is what is so striking about this episode. And that, I believe, is the reason why, in verse 30, the people actually take her seriously. And they respond to her invitation to come and see. Because they see that something is different about this woman. What happened to her? Where did all her shame go? How is she just coming here in the middle and, and just declaring to everybody, not hiding from us anymore? What happened to this woman? Well, we know, don't we? We know what has happened to this woman. For those of us who are here today who have believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and who have received the unconditional grace and complete Forgiveness of all of our sins. We know that this is what Jesus does, don't we? He removes our shame through the gospel. Amen? He removes our shame. Because you see, in the gospel, we come to understand that even though God knew the very depths of all of our sins, your past sins, your present sins, the sin you committed even before coming to church today, even your future sins, he knew that all, and yet he loved us so much that he gave his son Christ to die on the cross for all of our sins so that we could be completely forgiven and completely accepted and see our shame totally undone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And listen, brothers, sisters, if you are a Christian and you are here today battling with shame, if that is you here today, you need to remember this. You need to remember that any shame that you have carried with you this morning for whatever reason, and there are so many reasons that cause us to feel shameful, whatever it is, you need to know that Christ has completely dealt with it on the cross. And that means that even though you may feel shame, and by the way, let me just make clear, it is right for us to feel shame because of our sins. That's a right response, okay? If, if, if you're here today and you're, you've been sinning and you've got no shame, no remorse, something is wrong, okay? That's not a good sign. That's a sign that your heart has become so hard that you don't even feel sorry anymore for breaking the heart of your Lord, okay? So it is right for us to feel this shame. But with that said, although we may feel this way because of our sin, we have to understand that as Christians, if you're a Christian, if you are in Christ, believers, followers of Jesus Christ, you need to know that in the eyes of God, we are always accepted. And we are always welcomed. That's why I want us to say that to each other, right? Christ welcomes you. In Christ, you and I are always invited to come and to see a man who knew everything that you ever did and yet loved you. So much that he laid his life down for you on, on the cross. He knows. We are invited to come right now at this very moment. Today, tomorrow, for the rest of our days, we are invited to come. We need to remember this, brothers and sisters. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. And so if you are here today and you're walking in shame, I implore you to not allow those feelings of shame to keep you from running to Jesus, confessing your sins boldly, knowing that Jesus Christ has already paid for those sins. He's paid for them. You can come. You can confess. You can receive his grace because it is abundant. It is available always when you bring your sin and you confess before him. He knows it already. So come, brothers and 
And I pray that you would come, especially for those of you that, that resonates with your heart, where you came in just so heavy and burdened. Hear the words of your Lord that says, come to me, all you who are weary. Come to me, I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come. Come. Now let's come back to the story. Let's come back to the story. So we see this Samaritan woman now walking in her newfound freedom in Christ. No more shame. Openly telling people to come and see this man, Jesus, to which the people respond. And they actually start making their way to come and see Jesus. Okay, that, that's what's happening here. Now, at this point in the text, this point in the text, you have to imagine that the camera lens was on the Samaritan woman at that village telling everybody, and the people are coming, and then now it shifts. Okay, we're getting to the meat now part of the story. Shifts now to the disciples, okay, who, remember, had just returned from buying food, found themselves shocked to see Jesus talking with a woman, and then now this new story begins, which focuses on Jesus' interaction with his disciples. Okay, and all of this is happening. This story is happening while the Samaritan woman is out in her village. Okay, so it's kind of happening simultaneously. All right. Okay, verse 31. Meanwhile, that is meanwhile, back at the well now. Okay, so we're back at the well. The disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Let's stop right there. Well, this is one of those times in the Bible where we should really thank God that we know far more than the disciples in this passage knew. That we are able to know far more because for us, we read a passage like this and we're like, Hey, dummies, <laughs> don't you get it? Don't you get that he's not talking about physical food? Obviously, he's talking about spiritual food. Don't you get it? He's not talking about physical food. <laughs> Easy for us. But for them, there's no way they could have understood that. Okay? And it's totally understandable that they didn't understand this. It would, that would have been us if we were in the story. Because you think about it, again, they had just come back from getting food for Jesus because he was hungry. Right? He sent them to go get food because he's hungry. Now they bring food back to Jesus, and he tells them, I don't need it. I got food you don't know about. What? What are you talking did somebody bring him food? <laughs> how did he eat? How what are you talking about, Jesus? Right? That's how the disciples are. And when Jesus explains, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work, when he says that, there is no way that they could have understood what this really meant. At least at this point in their lives. There's no way that they could have understood that the Father's will, okay, what the Father sent Jesus to do was to save and redeem sinners by having his son crucified on a cross in our place for all of our sins. That to us is so normal. We get that. But they could not have imagined that this is what the Son of God was sent by the Father to do, to die. They could not have understood this. But we do so easily, don't we? We know that this is why Jesus came. We know that he came to die for us to take our place on the cross so that we didn't have to die, but by believing in him, we could have eternal life. We know this. And because we know this, because we understand this, now we can really just marvel at how amazing it is for Jesus to say, this is my food. This is what truly nourishes me and truly satisfies me. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that amazing? I mean, just think about it. Just think about this. What Jesus is really saying here is he is saying that the thing that gives him real strength, real nourishment, real satisfaction, real joy, it is to do the Father's will, which is to seek and save the lost. Starting with this Samaritan woman in this story. 
It has begun with the Samaritan woman. This is why Jesus, even though he's physically hungry, he is hungry, okay? Don't think for a second that just because he's Jesus, he wasn't really hungry. Like, he, he was a man just like us. When it says he's hungry, he's hungry. He's experiencing all that it means to be hungry. You guys know. You get cranky, right? All you can think about is food. He's experiencing that. But even though he is, even though he's tired, that's why he went to the well. He was weary. Even though he's thirsty, that's why he asked for the drink. He's thirsty. He's going through physical exhaustion at this point. But even though he feels no need to physically eat at that moment because he's been nourished, he's been satisfied, he's been satiated by seeing this Samaritan woman being totally set free. He's watched her go away in complete freedom. No more shame. Off to her town where everybody knew her and where she used to avoid everybody, but now telling them boldly, come see a man that knew all that I ever did. This is what gave Jesus tremendous strength and energy and satisfaction to see the lost saved from their sins. And don't miss the connection, brothers and sisters. Don't miss the connection. That, of course, includes you. And me, of course. And all of us who Christ came to save. This was his food. To save sinners like you. And like me. All of us. How amazing is that? Just take a moment. Just consider for just a a moment, how amazing your Lord is. Think about that. The fact that seeing you and I saved, it's not only what the Father sent Jesus to do, but it's what gave him enormous strength, joy, satisfaction, nourishment. More than a de nice, delicious meal on an empty stomach. More than some me time alone at the well to just, to just rest and, and, and recharge. I just need to refresh myself. More than that. More than a cool drink of water on a hot day to quench your thirst. More than any physical pleasure that this world could offer, what ultimately drove and satiated your Lord was to do the Father's will, which meant seeking and saving you and me and all those that he came for. How amazing is your Lord. Take a moment to just say thank you, God, for your incredible heart for the lost, for me. Praise him. Adore him. Honor him today in your hearts. Thank you, God, that you love me that much that you were that committed to doing your Father's will. Praise him. Praise him. Now, we got to keep going. I wish we could just stay there and just worship, but we got to keep going because we still have a passage to cover. So let's continue now in verse 35. Verse 35. So here, Jesus, he's now going to take this opportunity to teach his disciples about the tremendous opportunity and really calling to join in this eternal work of seeing the lost become saved. It's going to take this opportunity. And so let's look at verse 35, and we'll go to verse 38. Do you not say, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? In other words, he's saying there's, you know, there's usually a gap, to, to use the farming analogy, between sowing and reaping, right? You don't just sow the seeds and then you just reap right away. No, there's usually a gap, right? Usually. But he continues, he says, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. In other words, he's saying, look, open your eyes and see that the harvest is already ready, already that waiting time, it's over, okay, already. Verse 36, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. Now, what Jesus, what he is directly referring to here 
is the fact that the seed that was sown in the Samaritan woman's life, that seed, it's already bearing fruit. Already bearing fruit. Right? You can see <clears throat> she just told her whole town and they are coming. Right? And, and I don't think it's a stretch of, a, of imagination to kind of imagine Jesus when he says, look up and see. He's actually pointing to that, the crowd coming right there. Right? Remember, these stories are happening at the same time. Look, see, the seed that was sown in her life already bearing fruit. The harvest is coming, right? That's what he is directly referring to here, to here because he's really coming. Right? And then verse 37, he continues. He says, for here the saying holds true. One sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Now, there's a lot of interpretation on who exactly these others are who have labored beforehand. A lot of interpretation. Some think that it's John the Baptist Jesus is referring to. Others think it's the Old Testament prophets, right, all the prophets in the Old Testament. Still others think it's directly this Samaritan woman just right now. Uh, but whomever the case, okay, he's referring to, we have to understand that in an ultimate sense, it's really Christ. Jesus. It is Christ alone who has done the hard labor of laying the groundwork for salvation. He alone has sown the seed of salvation by laying down his life so that whoever believes in him can reap the benefits of eternal life. It is Christ who has labored before us. And we now, the church, believers of Jesus Christ, we now get to enter into his labor. We now get to proclaim his gospel, the only message that saves sinners from death to life. We get to proclaim this. And not only do we get to proclaim this, but this is what Christ has called us to do. He says to his disciples, and really to all of his disciples, all of his followers, he says in verse 38, I sent you to reap. I want everybody to say, I sent you to reap. It's the title of today's message. I sent you to reap. Brothers and sisters, I have to remind us and I have to remind our, myself, this is one of the primary purposes you and I are alive right now. One of the primary reasons that you are here on earth, that I am here on earth, and he didn't just take us up into heaven, it is to reap what Christ has labored for. To proclaim the gospel to sinners who need a savior because it is the only message that saves that is our primary, one of our primary callings in life. And probably, I am guessing that a lot of us, myself included, I am including myself in this, okay? I'm guessing that a lot of us, we need to hear again the words of Jesus exhorting us in verse 35. Lift up your eyes and see. Or, or, or maybe the more modern equivalent, okay, because we don't really say that, lift up your eyes and see. The more modern equivalent would be, wake up. Turn to the person next to you and say, wake up. They might really need it, okay? <laughs> yeah, some of you are like, oh, thank you, thank you, I needed that, right? Wake up. Take a look around you and see that there are people all around you who are in desperate need of the gospel right now right around us, at your workplace, in your family, your next-door neighbor, amongst your friends, the people that you hang out with regularly in this city. I think that many of us, myself included, need this reminder because it's so easy to stop looking, isn't it? If we're honest. It's just so easy to become so preoccupied with our ordinary lives, doing our ordinary business every day, living for the ordinary things, doing all that so much that we forget the extraordinary mission and purpose that God has called us to do. He's called us to do eternal business. 
to live for and work for things of eternal significance, which is to proclaim the gospel which can save people to eternal life, not temporary, eternal. Again, this is one of the primary purposes that God has us here on this earth. And so, I just want us to consider as, as an application point, okay, just for us to consider these two things. Number one, who? Okay. Who do I need to be paying more attention to? Who in my life do I need to be praying for actively? And actively reaching out to in hopes that they would see the gospel reaped in their life. Who in my life? And maybe some names are beginning to come into your mind. Yeah, I haven't prayed for them in a long time. I haven't reached out to them in a long time. Who? Or perhaps, number two, perhaps the question more is where? Where do I need to be looking? Where do I need to wake up? But because perhaps a who didn't come to mind. Maybe, maybe you really were thinking like, oh, I really don't know. I really just don't have any unbelievers around me. Maybe that was the case. And so maybe for you, it's more where then? Okay, because perhaps, um, like me, honestly, maybe you really haven't had that mindset of waking up and looking, seeking to see, are there people I can minister to at my gym that I go to every week? <laughs> or that, that coffee shop that I regularly go to, and I see the same co or same workers there at my workplace, or wherever, where do I need to be looking? We're more aware of to share the gospel, opportunities to share. So I just want you to consider that. Who and where? Because Jesus, he tells us in Matthew chapter 9, the harvest, it's plentiful. It is plentiful. But the problem is the laborers are few. In other words, more laborers are needed to reap Harvest is there. More laborers are needed to reap. And Jesus is saying here to us, I sent you, you, me, all who follow you to reap. Reap. So once again, consider who and where. Who and where. And I pray that as we consider this, it won't just become a consideration, but the Holy Spirit would help us to make it an action. Now, let's finish up the story with the last few verses, okay? Last few verses. Now, the, the sandwich, remember this is a sandwich. It's going to be completed now, okay? The story now returns to the Samaritan woman and the crowd of people who are coming to Jesus. And so let's look now at verse 39, and we'll go to the end, verse 30, 42. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. And by the way, that last little bit about these new believers telling the woman uh, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, now we've seen for ourselves. Just so you know, that's not to discredit her testimony. That's not to say, like, it didn't matter what you said. We really saw for ourselves. No, that's not to actually do that. It's actually rather to confirm her testimony, okay? Basically, what they are saying is, we came because of your testimony, but now we've seen for ourselves that this Jesus is exactly who you said he is. We've seen it, okay? He is the Savior Now, as we, as we come to a close, I want us to ask why these stories are here. Why? Why is the Apostle John sandwiching these stories together? Remember, I mentioned at the beginning, there's actually a point that he does this. Okay? There is a reason. And the point is this. It's in the final line of verse 42, that last little line. This is indeed the Savior of the world. That is the main point 
of all of this, okay? That Jesus Christ is indeed the Savior of the world. Everybody say world. Emphasize that for a reason. Doesn't say he's simply the Savior of Israel. He is the Savior of the world, okay? And if you were here a couple of weeks ago, we talked about what this word means, this word world, right? And if you weren't here, basically, you can know it's referring to people who are in rebellion against God, against their creator, people who hate God. Okay? That's who Jesus came to save, sinners, not good people, not moral people, not righteous people, but unrighteous sinners because there are no righteous people, okay? That's really what this entire section of John, uh, beginning from last chapter and chapter 3, that's what it really was all about, highlighting. Remember um, Nicodemus back in chapter 3? Nicodemus, this super righteous, super moral, super good man, right? Jesus, he comes to Jesus. Jesus says, unless you're born again, you're out, your good works can't save you. You must be born again. And now here we come to chapter 4 and Jesus invites a Samaritan woman. Someone whom the Jews would have despised as coming from a treacherous and sinful people group. And of course, someone who had lived a very immoral life. And yet Jesus engages this woman and he welcomes her. He says, ask me for a drink. Just ask me. I will give you living water that will quench your thirst forever. Ask me. He came to save the world. He came to save sinful people who are in desperate need of a Savior, which is every single person, including you and I before Jesus Christ. Sinful people. And so the point of all of these stories, it is to show us that salvation is here for the world right now. Happening before our very eyes in this story. Right? right at this very moment, salvation is here for the world through Jesus Christ. He is indeed the Savior of the world. He is saving even those who are seemingly furthest from him. The very people whom the Jews would have never imagined in a million years would be saved. The Samaritans, it's happening. It's happening. Because God's grace knows no bounds. No bounds. God's infinite grace extends to all. Whoever will believe in him and repent of their sin, grace is available. Whoever, he is the savior of the world. That means that there is not a single person, no matter how far they may be from the Lord at this moment. And some of us, we are thinking maybe of people who we think, no way that they, God can save them. There's not a single person that God cannot and will not redeem if they come in repentance and faith to Jesus Christ. His grace is infinite. Abundant. It extends to all who will believe in him. That's the point, okay? And the implication, okay? And really the call for us today once again, it's the same thing we just said in the title of the message, reap. It is time to reap. He has sent us to reap that which he has labored for with his life. We possess the message that saves. The message that we have been given, it is explosive. It is powerful, able to save a sinner from darkness into light. It is so powerful. And just like the Samaritan woman in this story, and just like the, the disciples throughout the New Testament, we are to share this message. We are to witness about Christ and reap in the harvest of seeing salvation come to the lost. And so as we close once again, I want to I exhort us to consider these questions again. Who? Who in your life can you be paying closer attention to this week? And you can give more time to praying for their soul this week. Who is it that you can think about, carry this message?
pray that this message would penetrate their heart. Who? Okay. And again, where? Think about your, your week, what it looks like. Where can you be looking for opportunities or praying for opportunities to share the gospel? God, give me, give me, a, give me a divine moment where I can share the gospel. Where? And lastly, one more thing, and this is the most important thing. Most important thing is I want you to consider when, okay? When will you pray for these people and for these opportunities, okay? And I ask you when because uh, many times when we don't have a when, it just doesn't happen, does it? (laughs) There are just too many things in our schedules that fly by, and so when, okay? And really, I ask you when because this is the most important thing to pray, right? We have to remember that it is only the Holy Spirit of God who can work salvation in the heart of an unbeliever. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Yes, we carry the message, but the Holy Spirit has to take that message and produce faith in a lost person. The Holy Spirit's got to do that. And so when will you pray? We need the Holy Spirit's help. And hopefully the when is every single day. You know, we're praying, we're praying, we're praying. But if that's too much to ask, then at least right now, okay? At least right now as we close, I want to invite us to just bow our heads for a word of prayer and just consider those questions as as we close and allow the Holy Spirit to maybe bring up some names or some faces or some places that maybe you usually go to and maybe you've never thought once to ever consider, hmm, God, is there someone I could share the gospel with here today? Like, Lord, could you open up a door that I could share this message that would save a lost sinner like you've saved me? This is the most important thing. And of course, I, I, know, I know when it comes to, uh, you know, witnessing about Christ, this is, this is not an easy thing to do, right? Like, I, I, I'll confess before you guys, yeah, I, I struggle a lot with fear of what people will think about me, fear of rejection, fear of not being liked. And I think all across the room, if we're honest, that's there. And in light of that, we should pray. (laughs) Because even the disciples, right, in the book of Acts, they're praying for boldness. And in the same way, we should be praying for boldness because that same Holy Spirit that made them so bold to, to be willing to risk their lives for the sake of the gospel, that Holy Spirit is with us, able to produce boldness and faith and fervency for his gospel, for his mission. And so if that's you, you recognize, man, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I, I, I'm just so afraid. I don't even know where to begin. Just start with a baby step. Ask Holy Spirit, God, just give me the boldness. At first. Give me the willingness to live on a mission to reap what you have laid down your life for. Help me, Holy Spirit. And so maybe just spend some time asking for the Holy Spirit's help, asking for even just the people and the names that have come across your mind or the places, asking the Lord for his help. Just give us a couple moments to respond in faith, and then I'll close us in prayer. Father, first of all, we want to thank you so much that Christ has done the heavy lifting, <laughs> the lifting that none of us could have ever done, the, that eternal work laying down his life on the cross, dying for our sins in our place so that we could reap the benefits of eternal life and we could share this message with people that forgiveness of all of your sins, it is available through Jesus, believing in Jesus. We just thank you for the amazing message that you've, been give, that you've given to us We thank you for this amazing calling, Lord. I was just reminded of how you say that uh, the sower and the the reaper, they rejoice together, that this is a great joy to be able to labor for lost souls, to reap and see a harvest, Lord. And and, uh, I was just thinking about that passage that says even when one sinner repents, there's there's this party in heaven. (laughs) Like, what what an amazing picture that when, when someone comes to faith and like, I can see hundreds of parties happen in this room, Lord. And Lord, to be able to be a part of something that glorious that just brings such joy and meaning in our lives and eternal significance, Lord, we're just thankful for this calling that you placed us, placed on our lives. And uh, Father, though, we confess and we acknowledge, Lord, that it's not easy for us. We often feel 
um, just choked up, Lord God, and, and, and so afraid and so embarrassed, and, and we don't want to look weird, and we don't want people to reject us or not like us or think that we don't like them, Lord. We, Lord, we, we confess that we go through all these emotions, and for so many different reasons, it keeps us from really witnessing um, and living on your mission, and we just want to confess that before you and ask you to help us, because we know, Lord God, that you saved us for this purpose, to testify and to witness to the greatness of Jesus Christ, Lord, with our words, with our action, and most importantly, with the message of the gospel. And so, Lord, help us. I pray, Lord God, that you would produce boldness in our spirits, confidence, Lord, in the message that saves a secure identity in you that is so secure that, Lord, even if the world would disown us and ridicule us, we know our security is in you. We know that our acceptance is already secured in you. Lord, I pray that you just ground us more deeply in you and help us to be more bold, God. And Lord, help us to open up our eyes, maybe this week, Lord, and see in a new way, maybe as we're walking the, the streets or we're on the buses, Lord, and instead of just tuning into our, our, our music or looking at our phones, maybe, Lord, we can just start praying for the people on the bus that that's seeds of the gospel, that you'd send laborers around them, Lord God, that they would hear the gospel message. And so, Lord, just make us more aware, God, keenly aware of the purpose that you've called us to. God, wake us up, Lord, we ask and pray that we would live for you and your glory and experience the joy of being on mission with you, Lord God. And so we thank you for this calling. We ask for your help, and we pray, Lord God, um, that you'd be glorified, Lord, as we submit to your will and trust you. We pray all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you, brothers and sisters.